an act of 1752, ordered that the bodies of executed criminals had either to be handed over to the surgeons for dissection or hung in irons. The latter involved the construction of an elaborate metal cage in which the body, having first been coated in pitch to prevent early decomposition, was publicly displayed, usually at a crossroads or roadside, close to the scene of the crime. The grisly spectacle of some local miscreant hanging by the roadside with birds pecking at sightless eyes was meant to serve as a powerful deterrent to those tempted by a life of crime. However, this macabre practice formerly referred to as hanging in chains had been an unofficial form of punishment in Britain for hundreds of years prior to the act. In Lincolnshire, the earliest known case of gibbeting happened to a woodcutter named John Keel in March 1731. Keel, from Bardney Dairies near Lincoln, lived in a farm cottage in the Wolds village of Mugton near Louth. A widower with five children, he eventually remarried Mary Aldgate from Swaby and had three more children with her. Keel was a drunk with a quick temper, and one evening during a violent row with his wife, he accused her of adultery with a neighbour whom he also suspected of being the father of their youngest child. She denied the accusations, but in a murderous rage, Keel snatched the infant from its cradle, and with a furze bill, a hooked hatchet, chopped off its head. He then attacked his wife with the same weapon, fatally stabbing her in the breast and throat. Keel was imprisoned for six months in Lincoln Castle, then brought before Lord Baron Page at the Lent Assizes on Tuesday, 7th of March, 1731. A contemporary pamphlet records his sentencing and subsequent execution. The judge pronounced sentence that he should be gibbeted alive, with intent to strike terror into the hardened soul of the prisoner. Yet the laws of England allow no such death. Therefore, on the above morning, Saturday, the 18th of March, 1731, he was taken from Lincoln in a light cart, and the gibbet irons with him, and with very little ceremony, hanged upon a post by the neck until he was dead. When being cut down, he was put into irons again, hung up between earth and heaven, food for every devouring bird of prey. He said nothing at the place of execution, but appeared with a wild and ghastly insensibility, terrible to behold. The post from Keel's gibbet was used for a time in the stables of the House of Correction in Louth. When these premises were demolished, the governor had the post turned into various souvenirs and mementos, and the gibbet cage can still be seen on display in Louth Museum. A tombstone in Surfleet Churchyard has the following inscription. This stone is erected in memory of Mr. Samuel Stockton, late of Ashby in the parish of Lee in the county of Lancaster, who was most barbarously murdered near this place on the 8th day of December, 1768, for which murder one Philip Hooton was tried and condemned at Lincoln Assizes, and afterwards executed and hung in chains in the very place where the horrid deed was committed. Philip Hooton, a local confidence trickster, had convinced wealthy trader Samuel Stockton to buy corn in Lincolnshire and sell it at a profit in Stockton's native Lancashire. While returning from the corn markets, presumably with some money, Stockton was lured by Hooton along a secluded path along the banks of the River Welland near Surfleet Reservoir, and there brutally murdered him. Hooton maintained his innocence throughout the trial, but he was found guilty and sentenced to be hanged and gibbeted at the scene of the murder in the March of 1769. For many months the riverside gibbet creaked under the weight of the murderer's corpse, and eventually the bones of the rotting man became mementos and souvenirs. The gibbet irons were once to be found at Welland House Farm, and the gibbet posts were put to use in the farm's crew yard. In the early 1930s, the chains from the gibbet were sold in Boston Market, and the scold's bridle 
a headpiece devised for nagging women, and the malicious that served as head irons was donated to the Boston Guildhall Museum by J. A. Parkinson in 1931. Evidence of gibbets has long since disappeared from our highways and byways. But in some locations, it is still possible to find relics pertaining to this grisly practice. A gibbet post farm near Normanby by Spittal, a gibbet tree stands, or lately stood, near farm buildings close to the road. It is possible that the body of one Thomas Brown was gibbeted here after he was first hanged at Lincoln in 1759. However, this is purely speculative, as the location of the gibbet was given as near Spittal. It is said that the irons from this tree were removed and used as the foundations for the nearby Pilford Bridge. Although historical evidence is lacking, there are stories of prisoners being gibbeted alive. There is a story connected to Gibbet Nook, situated between Tattershall and Coningsby, of a man being starved to death on a gibbet. A baker who was passing by gave him a loaf of bread to eat. This prolonged the felon's life. And as punishment, the baker was also gibbeted alive next to the man. People once removed body parts from gibbeted criminals for use in medicines, as it was believed that the moss growing on the corpse of a hanged man, particularly the skull, cured many ailments. An example of the practice occurred in Lincoln in 1830, when a multitude gathered to witness the execution of three men condemned to death at the late assizes. Two women rushed forward to rub the dead man's hands over some wens, which were warts or diseased body parts. The hand of a gibbeted felon was sometimes used by burglars for the dark purpose of creating a charm known as the hand of glory. The hand was first cut from the body, pickled in salts, and then dried. A candle. Made from the fat of the hanged man was then placed in the hand, which was then brought into the house at night. It was believed by the robbers that as long as the candle burned, the occupants of the building would remain fast asleep. Finally, this collection of grisly tales would not be complete without mention of the notorious wife murderer Thomas Otter, the last man to be gibbeted in Lincolnshire at Drisney Nook near Saxelby on the fourteenth of March, eighteen o six. The story goes that while working in Lincoln, Thomas Otter. An itinerant labourer from Nottinghamshire formed a relationship with local girl Mary Kirkham, who soon discovered she was pregnant by him. In accordance with the custom of the day, the magistrates gave Tom a simple choice: get married or go to prison. Tom chose the former. However, unbeknown to the magistrates, Thomas already had a wife and child in Southwell, Nottinghamshire. So, on November the third, eighteen o six, the couple were married at Highcombe Church. After the ceremony, the newlyweds were seen walking along the turnpike towards Saxelby. It was the last time Mary was to be seen alive. Her battered body was discovered some time later by the side of what is now the B1190 Donington Road, with the murder weapon, a large hedge stake, lying on the ground next to her. Otter was arrested in Lincoln, and on March the twelfth, eighteen o six, he was found guilty of murder and sentenced to be hanged. And his body gibbeted at the murder scene. After his execution, a great multitude gathered to watch as his body was placed in irons and suspended thirty feet above the ground. Over the years, it became a grisly tourist attraction that gained more notoriety when a blue tit built a nest in the lower jaw of the rotting corpse and raised a family of chicks in the dead man's mouth. The grisly spectacle inspired the following rhyme. Ten tongues within one head, nine living and one dead. One flew out to fetch some bread to feed the living within the dead. Thomas Otter's real name was Thomas Temporal or Temple. The word Otter is derived from the Old Norse Odin, and was often used to describe a hooded man. The man in this case was Thomas, and the hood was the head irons of the gibbet. Which can still be seen today at Doddington Hall near Lincoln.